Imagine if your communities were committed to supporting each and every individual on their journey to self-empowerment and economic mobility. And imagine if the organizations that were dedicated to supporting those individuals were driving the conversations with their funders and their stakeholders around their outcomes and what it meant to be successful. Thank you for joining us here today. We know it's the end of the day. Um, we're here to talk about developing nonprofit KPIs. My name is Emily Olson Harbick. I'm the Senior Manager of Membership and Resource Development with Catalyst Kitchens. Hi, my name is James Hondros. I'm an Impact Analyst at Catalyst Kitchens. And we think this work is important because for many nonprofits, it's really hard to understand whether or not you're successful. Um, in business, you can look at your bottom line and you can gauge your success. In nonprofits, it's a little bit harder. And so we set about to create meaningful standards for nonprofits that we work with to understand whether or not they're making an impact. So a quick preview, uh, we're gonna take a look at what it, Cattle's Kitchens is, what we are about, what we do. Uh, we're gonna take a look at how we've become a more data-driven uh, organization and network of organizations over the last couple of years. And then take a look at how this new data-driven focus has impacted our work. So Catalyst Kitchens is the national initiative of a Seattle-based nonprofit called Fair Start. And Fair Start in Seattle helps to provide food service job training for individuals with barriers to employment in the Seattle area. Um, we are the national arm and we work around the country uh, to scale that impact. Before we go into more detail, I wanted to provide a little bit of context uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows us that one in seven Americans is currently experiencing poverty. And the, in the communities where we work, we know that ratio is actually much higher. We also know that poverty is intergenerational, it is self-reinforcing, and it's incredibly hard to break out of. We know that many communities provide services that meet the symptoms of poverty and meet people's basic needs, and while those are incredibly important, they don't always help people to break out of the cycle. And that's why we work with nonprofits that provide job training rooted in food service social enterprise to help people escape the cycle of poverty. At Catalyst Kitchens, we do that primarily by helping to design and launch food service job training programs through our technical assistance and consulting arm. And we help to sustain and scale those programs that already exist by operating a membership network that helps to support and connect nonprofits. Uh, since starting our work, we have helped to work with over 150 organizations, and we've helped to place over 12,000 people into meaningful employment. For those of you that are interested in how a Seattle-based nonprofit was able to scale into a national initiative, a quick breakdown of that process. Um, so Fair Start in Seattle began fielding inquiries about their work and how they might replicate their nonprofit in the 1990s. Um, over time, we started to informally do some consulting and technical assistance around the country. And then we also decided to bring together other nonprofits that operate this model. We weren't the only ones doing it. We brought them all together in the same room and had conversations about how might we collaborate. We're, we're doing similar things. Um, and essentially, we decided to formalize both of those modalities, um, the technical assistance and uh, the collaboration with others. Um, we formalized uh, through our consulting arm and membership network officially in 2011. And we've been working in that model ever since. So the, the Catalyst Kitchens model, what does that look like? Uh, it's three basic tenets. We have uh, empowerment through job training, collaboration through community engagement, and sustainability through social enterprise. And all three of these tenets are built around food. So what that looks like is job training in the culinary arts, preparing people for careers in food service and hospitality. It's collaborating um, with our community through food. Uh, many of our members uh, have school meals or community meals uh, programs, making food for shelters in their communities. We're also collaborating with the organizations in our communities that provide the supports that our students and trainees need in order to succeed. And we're doing that all with social enterprises, food service social enterprises, cafes, restaurants, catering, um, and then also contract programs where we're making those school meals. And that means that the job training that's taking place is happening within a real business context. 
it's not a culinary school where you're preparing food and throwing it out. You're a student, but there's a real catering program going on. So there's a customer, it's time bound. Um, the skills you're learning are immediately applicable. Um, and so that's why social enterprise provides such a great environment for this. Right, frequently what that looks like for a student is uh, they may be coming, experiencing homelessness and coming out of emergency shelters and into transitional housing. They enter a Catalyst Kitchens program and one of the first things they might be doing is making meals for uh, a shelter system that they just came out of. So there's a real connection between the people involved in the programs and the communities that they come from. And we're training people in food because the food service industry is growing quickly and there's a rising demand for jobs in food. And also many people have gotten their start working in food service. Yeah, how many people in here have worked at a restaurant at some point in their lives? Yeah, that's about 40% about nationally. Um, it's a great place to start, especially because it's a low, uh, food service jobs tend to have a lower barriers to entry um, for people who are entering uh, the job market for the first time in a long time. So what is social enterprise? Uh, there's many definitions out there for social enterprises. We, we tend to adhere to the Social Enterprise Alliance. Uh, there are organizations that are addressing a basic unmet need, and they're doing that through a market-driven approach. Um, so that can look like a for-profit company or a non-profit organization. Warby Parker is an example of a for-profit, uh, buy one, give one model. Goodwill is a very well-known uh, retail social enterprise that, that uses the income to support their training programs. And Fair Start and the members of the Catalyst Kitchens Network are in that kind of goodwill model. Yeah, so for the context of our presentation, when we say social enterprise, we mean the food businesses that our members are operating to bring in revenue and provide a great training environment. Quickly wanted to provide some global context for our work. We know many people at this conference do work internationally and are working under the Sustainable Development Goals. These three goals really connect with our mission, um, and so we wanted to highlight them here for reference. Uh, quickly, a little bit more just about how we work. Um, our consulting services run the range of helping to design programs and provide them curriculum to get started, um, to helping programs scale and add additional components to increase their impact. Uh, this tableau visualization shows where we've worked in 2019, and the different colors represent different services that we've provided worked with uh, 54 organizations already this year. And our membership network that exists to support existing nonprofits once they're up and running, um, currently has 78 members all around the country um, in 63 cities and 32 states. The best thing about this map is that it's really hard to keep it updated even though it is in Tableau, because um, we are growing and always welcoming new, new nonprofits into the network. It's also really interesting because although they're all represented by the same circles on this map, all of these organizations are so different. Some of them might be focused on training women refugees in their communities. Others might be actually inside of a prison working on work release for people coming out of incarceration. So they're, they're really different and each organization is working with individuals that might be facing different barriers to employment. And I wanted to add that another reason it's a little bit difficult to keep that map updated is because for our database, we use Microsoft Dynamics CRM. So I have to manually refresh that anytime we want to make a new map, and that doesn't always happen on time. Right. <laughs> I wonder what we could use instead. I don't know. Um, so uh, just a little bit more about some of the barriers that individuals are facing across our network. Um, these numbers don't add up to 100 because many individuals that are facing a barrier to employment they're usually facing more than one barrier, so they may be experiencing homelessness and mental illness. Um, so these are the top five barriers that we see people experiencing homelessness, um, returning citizens or formerly incarcerated, experiencing mental illness, in recovery from drugs or alcohol, or physically disabled. And so these are the folks that our member organizations are providing training to. We're collecting a lot of data about, about these individuals and, and their movement through the programs. And so as you can imagine, we have a whole, we we're collecting a whole lot of data and we're here to tell you a little bit about what we've done with it. Thanks. So what have we done with our data? Well, first let's look at um, kind of our data journey. Uh, it started with our first survey that we sent out to our members to collect outcomes on their programs and the, their successes with their students. 2012, we sent that out. It has about a dozen questions on it, pretty simple. The following year, we of course realize there's more things we want to know. We, so we add another sheet. 
years go by, there's more things we want to know. Oh, we can get more detail. We add more sheets. Eventually it becomes pretty fragmented. And literally we had 10 Excel sheets that were part of this survey. This is an actual photo of each individual page of the Excel survey we sent out to our members. And, and I, I took a look at this when I started a couple years ago and I was looking at this document and I zoomed out on it, the whole Excel conglomeration. And I was like, you know what? This looks like, this looks like continental survey drift. It's like we had created a Pangea of surveys. And it was a big problem because it led to low compliance from our members because it was so darn complicated. And um, it was really hard to get the data out of it as well. Um, we weren't even equipped within our own team to analyze this data until we brought in volu a volunteer who did some coding to sort of bring everything together in one spot in a single flat file. So our question was, how do we, how do we go from this Pangea to a place where we were wanted to really like love our data. And um, it started with a, our relationship with the Tableau Foundation, provided us with grants and software, then the software. Um, but really what was crucial was the Tableau Service Corps. So Service Corps, two especially Service Corps volunteers really helped us launch our, our this process. They helped, one helped us create a new survey and another got us started with really understanding how to put our, get our data in order so that we could create like meaningful dashboards. Yeah, and just quickly, if you are working at a nonprofit right now, definitely check out the Service Corps. It's essentially free, highly skilled volunteerism supported through the Tableau Foundation and, and Tableau employees that volunteer their time and their expertise to help you with your data management and building dashboards. It's an incredible resource and um, it's definitely worth checking out. So real quick, we'll take a look. Uh, Tableau asked us in our presentation to take a look at our technology stack. We, re we renamed that our tech short stack because that's about where we're at so far. So we're bringing in all this survey data. It's being fed uh, through Google Forms. It's being fed into our Google Sheets data puddle. Uh, someday we hope to have a data lake, but we're not there yet. Yeah, just a puddle for now. We're doing simple, doing all of our work mostly in Tableau products. Tableau Prep Builder uh, is used to bring all of our past survey data, that whole mess we looked at before, in line with our new survey. And creating visualizations in Tableau, benchmarking reports that we send back to our members that they can use to um, communicate with their stakeholders, to use with their funders. And then importantly, we're also creating network outcomes that we share with our national partners and our na national funders for the network. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, those benchmarking reports that James just mentioned. Um, because um, as many people know, if you've worked at a nonprofit or are working at one, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it can be really hard to measure success. And a part of that comes from the fact that um, you might be compared to other nonprofits that aren't as aligned with what you do, but are in the same kind of field or focus on a similar enough initiative that funders sometimes group you all together. So in the world, in our world in culinary job training, a lot of our programs are compared to other workforce development initiatives like a coding boot camp or a construction apprenticeship. Now, of course, those, those initiatives aren't necessarily working with the most vulnerable populations. It's pretty unusual that you'll have someone experiencing homelessness attending a coding boot camp. Um, but they're compared to these programs nonetheless because they fall under the same category of workforce development. And so they're compared to program outcomes from, from other initiatives. So we wanted to create key performance indicators that were the most relevant for them. And so creating them from historical data in our network. So we realized the first step was we needed to test our assumptions. So up until the point where we started working with this new survey data and with Tableau, a lot of what we thought we knew or we did know about programs in our network were based on our observational, our kind of qualitative um, data collection. We would visit programs, see firsthand what was working for them, what wasn't, um, and, and we kind of had a set of best practices that we shared with our clients and our members. But now we had the opportunity to actually look at those, those components, things like uh, how long a program is, um, how they enroll students, what kind of supports uh, does a program provide. And by supports or wraparound services, we're talking about um, do they provide childcare, uh, do they provide transportation, or vouchers for transportation to the programs, uh, mental health counseling, et cetera. So now we could actually take those components and compare them against outcomes. Um, so the, some of the, an example of what we looked at was, um, do longer programs lead to higher rates of job retention? So most of our programs, one of the outcomes we collect is if six months after someone finds a job, a uh, graduate of the program finds a job, 
is that person still employed? And this is kind of a key outcome for these types of workforce programs. It's what funders really look at, is that are, are, your, are your clients still working six months or 12 months after they leave? And so this is just a quick example of looking at that job retention versus program length. Uh, I won't get into the details of the chart, but essentially it's a flat line. There's not, enough, there's not really a lot of um, correlation. There's programs having success at every length of program. Um, the really the reason I wanted to include this, gra this graphic up here, it's one of the first things we made in Tableau. And I love, when I went back and looked at it, I loved how it had all these colors that made no sense. And the, all the little marks are different sizes and I can't even remember why, why that is. So we, we, found, we found that like, okay, not really, some of these program co components aren't influencing outcomes. But we did discover something key, which was the thing that had the most impact on a program's outcomes were the populations that that program serves. So if we look back at those barriers, this is what's impacting program success in different areas, is who the, who the populations are serving. And it seems like a simple, obvious point, but um, it was really helpful to get there, of course, by looking first at the data and then coming to this conclusion rather than the other way around. So with that conclusion, we understood that the benchmarking reports would be most useful to our members if they could filter based on um, organizations that were most like them. They could, they could see whether or not they're successful by comparing themselves to other programs most similar to them. More of an apples to apples comparison. So we wanted to create filters around those uh, barriers and what the populations were. So we created filters around percentage of the program that was returning citizens, percentage of the program enrollees that were experiencing homelessness, and also um, just the size of the program in general. If you're a small program training 20 people a year, you really can't compare yourself to a program training 300 people a year. You want to get a more apples to apples comparison. So we wanted to create these filters to, to establish meaningful peer groups. Yeah, and returning citizens refers to people coming out of the justice system, the carceral system. So we'd have those filters on our report and we'd also be mapping organizations against our key performance indicators. Um, and these are uh, kind of the key standards that we pulled from our upper portion of survey respondents. And we, we landed on uh, key performance indicators around graduation rate of 65%, job placement rate of 75%, and job retention at six months of 65%. And with that information, we produced our kind of first benchmark report for our network. And um, I won't spend too much time on the chart. We know we've been looking at a lot of viz, vital vizs and dashboards. Ours is pretty simple. Um, uh, but just wanted to highlight a couple key elements of it that involve how we're using it to, to help our uh, members like tell a story about their outcomes, rather than just having funders, stakeholders focus on key components where they, they, it looks like they're not succeeding. Um, so on the, there's kind of just four charts on here, and they represent the KPIs. So up here we have the graduation rate, we have the job placement rate, what percentage are getting placed in jobs after they graduate. This is job retention after six months, and then job retention after 12 months. We have not developed a KPI for 12 months yet. We feel like we don't really have enough data for that, but we hope after a couple more years of doing these surveys, we'll be able to come up with a benchmark for the 12 month retention. And so each one of these bars on here represents a member. And I've highlighted a single member here, member 14, who happens to be a food bank in Pennsylvania that operates a job training program based in their community kitchen. So their community kitchen, they're at the food banks preparing meals that's sent out to shelters. Um, they also run a catering business and that they use that to train their students as well. And then up at the top are our filters, uh, num the size of the program, uh, homelessness and returning citizen. Those are the filters that I mentioned, yeah. yeah. So if we zoom in on that top left, you'll see that there's a lines there that just measures our KPI of 65%. And then here, the two lines are meeting, forming one line. The average of this whole group is 65%. And then the key for the members is now, they can take this filter for returning citizens and they can set it a little higher. So. Member 14 is about half of the students they're training are returning citizens. So it'd be more meaningful for them to compare themselves to other like organizations. So I've filtered out all the organizations that have less than a third of their student population are returning citizens. So then that takes 
so when we do that, we lose about half of the the survey set. Yeah. And Ah, uh, well, oh. in theory. Yeah, there we go. But the key thing that happens here when we, when we peer group is that our peer group average has dropped to 56%. So among these, these programs serving this particular population, they're actually having a lower average success rate with the graduation rate than our, our KPI. And so your results look a little better when you start to compare yourself with like organizations. And so if we zoom out real quick, uh, zoom back out quickly, with that filter still set to 33%, um, the other thing we can see here is now we can really start to tell the story is that, yes, these types of programs have low graduation rates, but they also tend to have high retention rates for the people they do train and the people they are able to place in jobs. Um, and, and this is really important, um, especially the experience for most programs and a lot of nonprofits is funders come to you and tell you what they want to know, what what they think is important and they might think graduation rate is the key measure of a workforce development program um, but when we're talking about these types of programs it's really not um, the success lies here the success lies in the places where we're meeting and exceeding our performance indicators for our network so um, that was our 2018 report We've been doing these for two years now. We've been sharing them with members of our network and we found that it really does help to validate their work in their communities. Um, one example is in Pittsburgh, our members there was able to take this report to a United Way meeting and secure uh, a multi-year grant because they were able to show their work in a more relevant context. The quote here from the executive director, being able to say this is what we measure and this is how we measure up to other organizations doing the same work we do places our work in a context that is relevant for funders. That's really what we were going for here. So we're excited to be able to share that it's happening and we're uh, planning on publishing these annually. Yeah. And another important uh, effect this work with Tableau and our new surveys has helped us do is we do standards review of our program. So we go to a program and we do a review based on both quality, uh, qualitative and quantitative measures of, of outcomes and their programs. And the, this peer grouping has been extremely helpful because we've started a program where we do peer reviews rather than just we go to a program to review it. We take a, a director, a person, program director from another organization and they travel with us to review this program. So it's a joint process, it's a learning process for everyone involved. And our benchmarking and the surveys, surveying we've been doing and work with Tableau has allowed us to really match up and identify those, those peer matches. Yeah, so this, these photos show uh, the executive director of one organization from New Orleans, Dennis, he went and visited the executive director at another organization, Life's Kitchen in Boise, Idaho. Both of their organizations focus on training high-risk youth through culinary job training, and so we brought them together in kind of the peer group in real life scenario. And to sustain this kind of data of initiative, we've also launched a fellowship amongst our network, we're called Data Champions. So we brought together representatives from 10 groups to start, and they're going to kind of form a core of becoming a data advisory uh, committee for the network. Um, over the fall coming years, we'll add more members to the data fellowship and hopefully really be able to spread uh, this kind of culture of data throughout the 78 members of our network. We're... Go ahead. Okay, well, uh, those are some of the ways that we are um, Tableau and establishing a culture of data to help us empower nonprofits to understand their success. Um, we also know that we've only just started uh, and there's a long road ahead. Um, we're working towards this vision to ultimately see in our network uh, a place where nonprofit organizations are using data to drive the conversation around defining what sex success looks like with funders. Um, and we're, we're eager to continue that journey. Uh, a quick success story from that organization in Pittsburgh that I mentioned earlier, who used our benchmarking report to leverage funding. Um, you know, we, we talk about data at a high level, so we wanted to share a story of an actual individual who completed one of their programs. Um, with that funding, they were able to support Jonathan, um, help him secure a job at a bakery where he's still employed. Um, he's actually been taking orders to, to make cakes and is applying for a food incubator fellowship to to kind of start his own baking business. 
Um, and actually through their program, he was able to receive some credits to a community college. So he's actually um, pursuing his credentials as well. So that, that concludes a lot of our presentation around key performance indicators for nonprofits. Um, we are, we're thankful for your time and, and curious to hear any questions after this. Um, before you take off, we just wanted to say that if, if you're interested in this work or inspired by anything that you hear, please do check out our website, catalystkitchens.org. Um, in particular, check out our member map. You might be surprised to find that there is a member organization in your community. Um, and if you're so inclined, you might be able to dine with them or order catering through them for your next holiday party, for example. Um, also volunteering, if that's something you have time for in your lives right now. Um, many of these organizations are gearing up for really busy season over the holidays and volunteers in the kitchen are always appreciated. Uh, finally, our communications coordinator was adamant that I ask you to follow us on Twitter. We're actually fairly new to social media, so uh, if you want to stay connected with us, you can do that. Our, our handle's right here. Um, and thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you.